for many organizations, for mine I know, in order to perceive the value accurately, I've got to get input from other people in the organization. Business is messy and unpredictable. Sometimes lonely. So lonely. So lonely. (laughs) And inspiration can often come from really weird places. We pick up where the bullet point blogs and the highlight reels leave off. We start with the stories. Welcome back to So Here's My Story. I'm Jody. I'm Elliot. And we have two quick announcements. One, if you are anywhere in the area of Baltimore, uh, on July 18th, we are having our first annual, uh, or first ever, not first annual, first, yeah, first ever. ever. Uh, so Here's My Story happy hour. So details to be announced. We're not sure exactly where yet, but it will be July 18th, roughly happy hour-ish time of the day. <laughs> yeah. So it's probably not going to be a 10 in the morning. Isn't that when you start drinking? It's- well, but for everybody, for our audience, I'm trying to read the room, gotcha. Jody. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Secondly, um, we, as we said last episode, just a quick reminder, we want to hear your thoughts, your feedback, little things that you would have chimed in on the conversation if you were around, and your stories if you have them. So you can either call or text, um, if you call, leave a voicemail to our story line, which is 410-205-6055, or you can just record a little voice memo of any kind and email it to us at talk to us at so here's my story.com. Okay. Off we go. So what we're going to talk about, Jody tells a story that I, I love. It starts out with a performance review, which which I think listeners of the show know that, that we both find to be painful, a performance painful review. And, and cringy and all that stuff. And we delve into, we start with word choice, but we really get into a conversation of the different things of value that people bring to an organization that may not quite be in their job description. Off we go. So here's my story. There have been a number of conversations in the last month or two that have reminded me of what is now a hysterical story from my earlier career. Um, At the time, it was not very hysterical, as as many stories come to pass. There's a benefit to Um, perspective. Yeah. So so I I was with, you know, I was with, this has probably come up before, but I was with the architecture firm that I was with for 16 years, um, give or take a little. And um, over that time, you know, a lot of things changed. We grew from like 10 people to close to 50. My role kept changing. And as you know, now I know that's just who I am. You know, I make things better. And then once they're kind of fixed and better, then I need to move on to the next thing. And that was why I stayed so long as I got to try on all these different hats. And, and what I thought was a very unique story to me, but now that I spend a lot of time with my fingers in other businesses, I I actually hear this a lot, which is why I wanted, wanted to bring it up. My role took this very like me shaped kind of shape. It was very unique to me, like I would take on things that were just sort of suited my skill set or whatever. And and as I think happens a lot of times, I I had a sort of a job description of tangible things, this checklist of like actions I did. I don't know quite the right Mm -hmm. words to say. Like there were things I did, the doing of my job that was very clear. Then there was this whole other amorphous almost like sort of the white of an egg. Like there was this very clear egg yolk that was my job description, technically what I was hired to do or or tasked with. And then there was this sort of like oddly shaped the white of the egg around it of a fried egg of like these things that were not in my job description, never would be in a job description, but yet everyone valued them, not just me. It's not like I made them up, but they were this more amorphous kinds of things that nobody knew what to call. I didn't really have a title for a long time. By the way, I have to say that this is a theme that runs through your entire professional career because you have a hard time describing what you do now. That's not as much, not as much. That's a different episode. (laughs) So this was a time where um, everybody knew that, and there was this joke that I was like, I didn't have a title, like she who doesn't have a title Mm because they couldn't name it. But so this all came... (laughs) came to pass in this review. And one of the principals at the time... A review with um, all the principles and yeah, like a like, like a, a performance review, performance like the review. once a year kind of okay. like talk about you know what you're doing or whatever. Yeah. And the funny thing about this is, I knew he valued the work that I did, but this was just kind of the person. You know, he's one of those people that you have to brace yourself because the way the words come out sometimes can yeah. be painful mm-hmm. and a little like, oh my god. So what he said was, um, you know, really putting me at ease, something to the effect of, "What exactly is it that you do?" Oh, nice. That's always a great way to start a conversation. <laughs> I was like, I- I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what? And then he tried to clear it up, tried to make it better. Um, and he said, it's just that it seems like a lot of what y- you do is superfluous. 
Wow. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's not a conversation that gets branded on your brain. Oh, oh, not at all. Years later, he and I have joked about this many, many, many times. He swears that he did not use the word superfluous. And I was like, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> Trust me. Like, I, I have just a, make that yes. No, no. I remember going back to my desk and that, that word was like branded in my brain. Oh, wow. So and will never. Every time I hear that word, I'm like, I have this like internal shudder. Bet, yeah. and, you know, and interestingly, every, you know, all the other principles at the table kind of jumped in when he said that in horror. And they're like, well, well, no, I mean, we value the things. And he goes, oh, of course we value them. But just, and his point was, and this is what I wanted to get to, there, there was this whole like amorphous, I don't even know why I want to call it a skill set. I mean, because they were so hard to like name and put your finger on that everyone agreed, including him, had enormous value to the firm, but they weren't things you would hire someone for. And in this case, and what's interesting is where I've seen this come up a lot is the same, same kind of pattern with somebody, but where it came up a couple of weeks ago was someone for whom that the egg yolk, the checklist of like the job that somebody was hired to do, they were actually kind of crappy at that part of it. And they, mm-hmm. they, they kind of wanted, they're like, I, I could get somebody better for probably less money, but they were hesitant to get rid of them because this person, the white of this person, person's egg white around it, whatever you call that, the um, like a Friday, yeah. that amorphous part, the circle around it was so valuable that I don't even know how I'd find somebody else who could do those things. And I need those things. That is fascinating to me that there, and I think it happens a lot probably where there are sort of like the job description, it feels like a checklist to me of like, dunk, 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 dunk. That's often like I could find other people to do that thing. But then there's this like weird amorphous glue that people bring or sometimes it's a cultural like something they bring to the culture or maybe it's in my case it was what ended up being a lot of what I do now, sort of the facilitation of the mm-hmm. leadership teamings, the the coaching, the sort of like paying attention to the culture and the people and the, all that stuff was um, kind of the weird in between and random projects. There were other things besides those. but Well, you know, and it does remind me of certain of the sports shows I listen to. They come up with their, for could be NBA, could be hockey, could be whatever, but they have their all glue team. And they, hmm. they identify these athletes who they don't fill the stat sheet with with, you know, they're the highest scorers or the, mm. the, the this or the that, whatever it is. But they just, they make things better hmm. by being there. And it, it reminds me, there's, um, as you know, I, I went to Duke and I'm a Duke basketball fan and there we just lost half of our listenership. Um, <laughs> but there was a, a guy named Shane Battier on Duke's championship teams uh, back in the 90s, and he had a good NBA career. And I remember commentators talking about him because they would say, you know, he's not the best scorer, and he's not the best this, and he's not the best that. But the thing about Shane is every team he's on wins. Hmm. And he was interviewed, <laughs> and I was listening to him, and he's a, he was a very smart, great student of the game. And he would break down, like he, he was talking about going against some of the greats, like LeBron or, or something. Mm-hmm. And he realized that, well, this person is just not really as good as he, if he has to go to his right. And so, oh, he would know these little things, and he would just, he wouldn't block the shots. Right. He wouldn't steal the ball, but he would just make it so his team has a much better shot oh, of being successful so by adjusting certain little things. So, he could like see a weird thing. He could see a weird thing. And he positioned himself to make everybody around him better and to overcome the opposition. And that to me, I know it's weird, but that says what I'm hearing. It really, it's really interesting. I I, I mean, it feels weird to like take it back to talking about me, but that's sort of what, like in my years there, that is sort of what it felt like. I felt like I was good at making everybody else better. Right. And, but, but in weird and different ways that, you know, sometimes look like a spreadsheet, sometimes look like a hard conversation. I mean, it was hard. That's why it was so hard to put in a box is that like some of it was left brain, some of it was right brain, some of it was this. And, but it all came back to, to that kind of like seeing things that other people didn't see or didn't care to put energy into and making them better so that things got easier and smoother and, well, you know, better. Do, but Do you remember huh. the old BASF ads? No. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, we're going to have to get into this. You're uh, a Christy. full decade older than me. So, yeah. Yes. And this obviously came from my zero to 10 years. But um, <laughs> uh, so, Christy, BASF classic ads. And what they, what they said was, we don't make the tires. We make oh, the tires. Okay. Oh, I do remember better. This. Okay, and it would have other examples. This yep. probably wasn't yep. one of them. I but do we don't make those. the engines. We make the engines run cleaner. Right, and so they were really describing that 
niche. You can't even say what they did Mm -hmm. in essence, but you know the effect of what they did. Well, and here's why I wanted to bring this topic up because every time it comes up, I mean, even just now when you were describing that guy that by the time you get to the end of the story, I'm like, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to call him (laughs) that guy. Uh, Describing that guy. Even when you're describing it, just I was imagining even him hearing this, even knowing that like he's this highly valued person who the teams he's on wins. Like it's such a high thing. But having to hear, you know, he's not the greatest at this. He's not the greatest at right. that. He's he's kind of mediocre. He's pretty you bland. He's not terribly good looking. Yeah. But he's got this thing. And it's almost like this afterthought. And that's what was so interesting is that the reason, because I will go back to that, that review I was sitting in, that particular principle, I know for a fact he valued me immensely. Mm -hmm. But what he, the reason it came out the way it did was that he was feeling almost, these are way too strong words, but like almost guilty for valuing this amorphous, undescribable, like tough to put in a box kind of thing. And that's what I see happen all the time. And so there are two conversations here. If I stick with that sort of egg yolk checklist kind of thing, it's it's very different if somebody's good at the job they're doing, and then they also bring this other bit. That's right, great. Sure. I mean, this guy, you know, the Shane, what's his name? Um, he was, I'm not going to remember <laughs> it. Just stop saying it even. Um, I just remember it's got a lot of consonants in it. Um, he's, he was competent enough. I mean, they wouldn't have kept him around for no, that other stuff good. if he was like a complete yes. klutz or whatever. Right. So like competent enough. So it, there is a continuum of this. This conversation changes about how much you can put, you know, invest in that amorphous bit that surrounds it. If the person's yeah. completely crap at their job, then you, you right, know, yeah, it has right. to be different. Although, Correct. but those are some of the conversations I've had though. Like there have been times where somebody is bad at what they do, but the thing that they bring that feels irreplaceable, like I could, I w- could never find somebody who brings that level of trust or, or whatever mm-hmm. for that thing, this thing that I need. And so it's still worth it to me. And it's, it's just fascinating. I think that there's a part of the job that feels like take tab B, stick and slot A, that you could probably find anybody to do certain things. And, and then for me, the way that all panned out was over time, the things that were actually my job description, like the gum lost, it, that's that yeah. gum lost its flavor for me. And I was so, and I ended up taking all that egg white. And that's now the business that I do. Like that is what I go and do. And that is the value that I bring outside of it. And I left those other things behind, but, but it doesn't always work that way. But I think what he was, what he was really getting to is one of the issues that I see with a rigid job description, and maybe in his mind, he had a rigid job description for what you were supposed to be in Mm -hmm. his mind. And then you start describing people in the negative, like, well, she doesn't do that. And Mm -hmm. she's not the best at this. And she doesn't do this. Okay, so what is it? Because all you're doing is you're using some some description in your head, whether it's a job description, a formal job description, or just what's in your head as a reference point. And then all the egg yolk that may be incredibly valuable outside can only be defined in the negative. Well, it's not really what she was hired for. It's the not the yolk is the yellow part. Though. Oh, I'm egg sorry. White. Egg white, whatever. Stick with the metaphor. <laughs> Shane Battier. Um, so, all the, the egg white is, is just, well, it's not yolk. Well, it's but, not this. And here's what's fascinating. So, you stick with Shane, Shane Guy, that his his, his, stop it. His, this skill set that he had was like a, to me, it, it's almost like, you know, if you have that goose that lays golden eggs, mm-hmm. they, they have this skill set that you wouldn't even have necessarily asked for. You didn't even know it was a thing. It's almost, it's not magic, but it sort of feels like magic. Like we wouldn't even be able to go hire a guy to do what he does. Right. It's this thing that's like, whoa, I didn't even know that was a thing. And so it has enormous value. And yet it'd be like describing this goose that lays golden eggs, you know, just starting with, well, you know, she's not great at flying and, you know, makes, yeah, she's a little tough, you know, we are like, but why can't it's, it's interesting in business that there are these things that when you find that a person who has these kind of, we'll just call it magic qualities that, that are different, that don't fit on a sheet really well, then why is there such hesitation to just value that? And I, I think part of it is that those things don't typically go together into a full-time job. You didn't spend all day long doing those things. You you have to have some sort of other value, I guess. But part of me wants to say why. Like, Well, but part of it is not just, I think, 
whether or not it's a full-time job. I think part of it is also that the, it doesn't fit in the system. You mm -hmm. know, if you, if you have a process where you've hired people for X and you're going to have to evaluate people to determine how well they do that for which they've been hired. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to figure out how well they do X and because you know X fits into your whole mm -hmm. organization chart, whatever. Well, the more rigid your process, the more unforgiving your process, the less room it leaves for the egg white, the less room it leaves for people who stray outside and really discover what their gift to this organization is. Right. Well, and just imagine the way that you framed it. If, if the whole point of the team is to win and you've yeah. got a guy who in ways that you don't quite understand when he's on a team they win. Do you really need him to like check the, I mean, like that's that sort of rigid thing. Like if you had rules in place where, well, you have to, you know, to be on this team, you have to make, I'm just making an X amount of baskets. You have to be able to do this. And he's falling short on those things. If you're so rigid that you let them go, you're kind of m missing. To me, it's the whole forest trees thing too. Like if, if having this person around helps us win, do I really have to hold them? Like, do, 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 well, like, that's, like, that's a huge, can I value that on its, in its own merit? Right. I mean, that's a huge part of it because you can say, yes, we want to win. But if you say we're only going to win if we make 57% of our three-point shots, mm -hmm. then you're looking at everybody against that standard. Well, you're not a great three-point shooter, so we're mm -hmm. not going to have you. So, in, in my world, there's an orthodoxy about hiring lawyers. Once you hire a lawyer, if they've gotten a certain amount of seniority, if they've gotten five years, six years, mm -hmm. 10 years, whatever, they not only have to be good lawyers, but now they have to be great at business development. Right. And if they're not good at business development and they don't have their own practice, then we're going to have to let them go eventually because we need, in order to win, in order for our firm to be successful, we need the lawyers to be good at business development. And we've talked about this and, and it's a self-evident point that that not everybody is great at business development. No. We have lawyers here who are fabulous lawyers. They are great at what they do, but they're not networking people. Right. That's not what they want. And it doesn't make that problem go away it, that, that you need the business development, but it, it just means that that's not the only way to solve it. Having everyone right. also be a good business development, like it'd be great if it works that way, hats off, but it, that there are other ways to, to meet that need that don't have to look like that. The, the other place that this shows up that I think is so interesting is that all this egg white that we're talking about is never easily put on a resume for that person at the next place. So, you know, you could be looking at somebody and that resume or the, you, know, you ask them certain kinds of questions, you're only going to hear about that egg yolk job description, easily definable part yeah. and finding ways to capture that thing. Because I think a lot of organizations need these magic skills as much as they need, if not more than they need some of the check the box skill sets, but it's, it's tough to define them. It's certainly tough to hire for them. And in a lot of these cases, I don't even know that you know you need that thing until it's there. But I think once it is there, I think there should be less guilt around valuing it and keeping it and and cutting the suit to fit the cloth around that thing. If, if Especially if it falls into a category of like, gosh, when this guy's on a team, we, we win. <laughs> right. No. And, and that's true. But when you're talking about the resume, where my mind naturally goes is also the personal development. So that when I was looking at, you know, continuing education and things that I want the people in my firm to get better at and to develop skills in, mm -hmm. it's very easy for me to find continuing education opportunities for them in that egg yolk sphere, in their job yes, description. Yes. But there's certain people that I've worked with who are incredibly gifted, not necessarily at, let's say their job was in accounting or whatever. They did fine. But what they were really good at is spotting holes in the whole process mm -hmm. or, you know, in making things more efficient. Well, it's harder to find yeah. professional development opportunities or continuing education on, well, I know you have this gift. Right. I want to get you better at what you really enjoy and what you're good at. So let's find something that trains you better in finding holes in processes and making them more no, efficient. It, it, I was just thinking of like Harry Potter kind of. I mean, it's sort of like this Hogwarts school of like, it's not the normal school. It doesn't, it's, it's not like you can go take those classes at the local community college. They are these off the wall you know, not easily defined skills. Uh, my friend Lisa Bowles has um, this great way. I, the first time I saw her speak, and I may have mentioned this before on the show, but the first time I saw her speak, she was talking about the word weird and that the word weird mm -hmm. originally 
um, is derived from, and I might get this part, I think it's Celtic. I can't remember which exact language it comes back to. I think it's Celtic and it's W-Y-R-D. And it, it actually translates back to something that means destiny. And her whole sort of concept and everything that she does is what makes you weird is like what you're here to do. And that the things that you see that others can't is your like magic sauce thing you're bringing to the world. And it just, I am so often struck by how bad we are because we do need things to be systematized. We do need there to be clear roles and responsibilities. I I don't, when there are not clear roles and responsibilities, all sorts of other problems happen in organizations. So that is true. And equally true is that if you can find the ways to bring out people's magic sauce and, and it's a magic sauce that you need in your organization and nurture that. And even just, maybe it's not a continuing education. Maybe it's just more space and, and permission to spend time doing those things. I mean, much to the credit of, of the architecture firm, the reason I stayed was they allowed me to keep putting on different hats and try on new things. And they allowed me to, they allowed me the space to make things better. And they never got in my way, mainly because they wanted to just go be architects. So that worked right. out great. Um, but I was, I was given the space to, to flex those muscles and develop those skills. And um, I think there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of value in that. Um, and I, there's a lot of value in that. But one of the things that, that I think is important is that for many organizations, for mine, I know, in order to perceive the value accurately, I've got to get input from other people in the organization. In hmm. other words, I've got to talk to people because I might not see everything that X person is doing that makes oh, life better for everybody. Yep. And so I have to have a culture. I have to have a culture of communication and conversations where it comes to my attention as the owner that, hey, you know, this is getting done because so and so was able to do that. Or, hmm. geez, I'm glad that so-and-so is here to do it because I never would have thought of that. Mm-hmm. And to have those conversations in the hallways, you know, yeah. where it's not just in the conference room with an agenda, but you have those kind of discussions and you you are able to take the temperature mm-hmm. of your entire team. Yeah. I think that's where, for me personally, that's where I've learned, oh, I had no idea she was doing that this whole time. <laughs> it's funny. I do this. Um, I made it up on the spot this one time and it has become one of my most repeated facilitated conversations for teens. You can't do it for like 20 people, but, but any small ish size team you can do it for. And I use those vertical flip chart pages and I just draw a line across the middle. So there's a top and a bottom Mm -hmm. and above the line is anything that that person is amazing at doing and it's their superpower and things that Mm -hmm. they can do that nobody else can do and things they love doing. And below the line is stuff that, you know, if, if it was possible, they would never have to do again and um, stuff they hate doing, maybe stuff they're bad at doing or avoid doing whatever I have them sort of fill out that list. And then I have the other people on the team chime oh, in right. on like, yes, I know you're fine doing X, Y, Z, but that is a waste of your talent. Like somebody else could do that. And it's, I, I don't think that's a good use of your time. And that kind of goes to the bottom ver- versus, and what almost always comes out is when, when we talk about, you know, what is this person's superpower? What is, what is it the thing that they can do that nobody else can do? That's like so unique to them. Often these are the kinds of things like they'll say things like you're the person that I come to when I'm not sure the right thing to do. And I can just tell you a couple of things and and you just have some sort of insight that or like you make things clearer for me so I can keep moving and I don't get bogged down. And that's not on a resume. Oh, God, no. And often the person is shocked to hear. And it's really interesting. This just goes back to another thing. I believe it is a lot easier for people to like this. This is not what people think, but this is the truth. It is a lot easier easier to get people to sit still to hear where their weaknesses are and what they're bad at than it is to get them to sit still and take in and digest what they're really good at oh, doing. Oh, I hate, I hate those. Things. I know you do. I, yes. your, your skin is already boiling hate, from across yeah, the room. I, yeah, and so does. getting them to sit still, it's often a very emotional thing for people to hear what is valued about them and what is so uniquely them. And it's, it's a fascinating, you know, I wish it was easier to do with like 20 people, but it's just too much time. But even in small teams to hear from other people, like this is, this is why, this is what I value about you. And it often brings out some of those like harder to describe, but really important key things. Things, um, that people bring to the table. Yeah, it does. And as cringy as those conversations are, I know. And the reason that we don't have them often enough is because I think they are very difficult to go through. I know for me, they they are very difficult, but they do highlight some of the greatest possibilities in your organization. It, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you can't just eat egg yolks. 
So that's our story. But the discussion doesn't have to end here. No, it does not. In fact, we don't want it to. No, we don't. (laughs) That is why we actually have our private Facebook group. Which we started to make sure that we could get your comments, your rants, your thoughts. Your stories. Your stories. You can find links to that group as well as show notes and links to subscribe via email and how to find us just about anywhere you can possibly find podcasts at SoHere'sMyStory.com. And you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at SHMS Podcast. And since we know it takes a village. Yes, it does. (laughs) We'd like to thank our village, our super talented, incredibly patient team. And occasionally snarky team. Yeah, but in the best of ways. In the best of ways. snarky. Yes. (laughs) Good mockery. So a huge shout out to the people who actually help us produce our show. Uh, First, our sound engineer, Tom Hansen. Thanks to Christy Schmier for our brilliant show notes and all the other fantastic writing she does for us. And to Taylor Mathauer for doing just a little bit of everything. Including wrangling us. Including wrangling us. <laughs> Which is no small feat. No, it's not. This is Jody Hume. And I'm Elliot Wagenheim. And you've been listening to So Here's My Story.